So there's a very interesting set of debates going on at the moment about valuing biodiversity. Um, and there are reasons for that because very often biodiversity conservation is at odds with conversion of natural habitat for other purposes, for example, for agriculture, for forestry, or whatever it may be. And so there's real interest in um, trying to put an economic value on um, intact biodiversity, intact rainforests or whatever. Um, of course, you can do that. You can look at the economic value of all the things that an intact forest does compared to a converted one. And that very often um, gives you the result that actually preserving intact habitats is economically a sensible thing to do. Not always, but very often it does. But there are also non-economic values. So people just like diverse systems. We like to see the diversity of a coral reef or a rainforest. Um, they're important for aesthetic pleasures, for you know, cultural significance and so on. And those areas are difficult to value economically, but they're still equally important. So if we take biodiversity meaning the variability of the living world in some sense, then there's lots of lines of evidence that that variability changes over time and place. Um, so it matters whether you're in a polar region or in the uh, tropics, how many species there are, for example. So there are some physical drivers just of um, how much diversity there is. There's no question that over the past um, few hundred years, people have had a massive and profound influence on the world's diversity. Um, we're a very dominant species on Earth. The way that we convert natural habitats um, for our own use, for, for agriculture, for urbanization, for infrastructure, um, has had big impacts on the natural world. And that's both um, removing natural habitats and the other effects of people, such as moving species around the world, climate change, overexploitation, and so on. So probably at the moment, um, those effects of people on biodiversity are overwhelming the natural processes that have previously dr driven patterns of diversity. So um, at the moment, the discussions are about what money we can find from the developed northern countries to the um, countries of the south, the biodiversity rich countries that don't have the resources. It's very difficult right now because there isn't much spare cash. And I think there are a few ways you can prioritize it. One, you can prioritize it around species that people really like and value. You know, the charismatic megafauna, if you like, the beautiful birds, the tropical diversity of uh, primates, mammals, um, uh, bird species, amphibians, and so on. The other way is to prioritize the biodiversity that contributes to other things that people benefit from, to food, fresh water, climate regulation, um, production of timber and firewood and all those kinds of things, what we call the biodiversity underpinning ecosystem services. And those two things are not necessarily quite the same thing, but they're on parallel tracks. And at the moment, I think there's a lot of attention being given to trying to find areas where there, are, there is biodiversity underpinning ecosystem services, particularly things like climate regulation, that also delivers good um, benefits for the conservation of biodiversity. So things like tropical rainforests are kind of win-wins in that argument. You get both from preserving them. Coral reefs, a lot of offshore areas have very unique species, um, complements that people like, but are also areas very important for marine nutrient cycling, primary productivity, and so on. So I think trying to find these um, areas of overlap between those two is really important.